and then it is C draft. Um, Amherst dash section C dash D. Okay. Draft blah blah blah. Pat, if you're still having trouble with SharePoint, can you can you touch base with me um, tomorrow or over the weekend so like we can figure out what's going on? Yeah, for some reason or other, things aren't there. There were more things this time today than there were yesterday. So I'm literally having to go through the town website, which I've yeah, never I, had to do before. Yeah, you shouldn't have I'll, to do I'll that. Deal with so it later. Let's let's touch base offline. Um, I'll have a little bit of time during the day tomorrow or okay. over the weekend. So let's get that started. Okay. Thank you, Athena. You're welcome, Mandy. We're recording. Okay, thank you for that. Um, okay, and okay. I've seen a presence of a quorum. I am going to call the April 28th, 2022 community meeting of the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council to order at 4.32 p.m. Um, pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public is permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time. At this time, I'm going to take attendance, a roll call, so that we can ensure that all committee members can hear and be heard. And then I'm going to roll call a couple of other people and explain a couple other things before we really get started with the meeting. Uh, members of CRC, Jennifer Taub. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Present. <laughs> Pat DeAngelis. I was Present. looking at that document. I'm sorry. <laughs> Pam Rooney. <laughs> yeah, because we're all trying to read it. Pam Rooney. Mm -hmm. um, and is Shalini here yet? I do not hear Shalini no. Um We'll catch her when she arrives. Mandy Johanneke is present. Um, I'm also going to make sure that Michelle Miller, another counselor that we've invited for as a committee for conversation during the rental residential rental registration bylaw conversations, can hear us. So Michelle, present. Thank you. Um, Shalini has just indicated she is running late, so she will be joining us when she does, and we will make sure she can hear us at that time. The first order of business, so a couple of things about the agenda, and then we're going to get into the order of business and, and do some explanations. There are no public hearings. We have removed from the agenda for today the proposed preservation of historic structures general bylaw. The historical commission has not finished reviewing and making determinations on that bylaw yet um, for us to then take it up again. So it has been removed. Um, it will show back up on our agenda as soon as the Historical Commission has some recommendations for changes as a result of what we've talked about last meeting. Um, the bulk of our meeting today will be on the residential rental bylaw, um, types of licenses, license exemptions, student home discussions, all of that is the plan for today. Um, because we'll have more time than normal, we will probably maybe go a little afield of that, but we're gonna try and keep it to that. I know not any conversation in this regarding this bylaw can truly be kept to one particular section because they really do interact. I will be taking very good notes um, for that. But before we go on to that and the rest of the stuff, one of the things we're using with that, um, and then we'll move on no later than 6 p.m. to the rest of the agenda. During the residential rental bylaw discussion, we're going to be doing two things. We're going to, in the middle of it, take a break from committee discussion and planning board, uh, planning department dis member discussion to move to public comment on that issue. Um, and so we're going to take specific public comment on that during that discussion, but we're also going to try to we're going to incorporate the community click um, platform into this discussion. And so for now, I'm going to put the screen up that describes community click. Um, why? I hate when it does share and I can't share certain things. So um, let me see, try this, and that's not the portion I want to share. Let's see, pardon, this is, I have to share a portion of my screen only. 
Okay. So right now, everyone should be able to see the QR code and the web address to join Community Click. Um, so that is the site that you will go to if you want to uh, try out this system during the meeting. I'm going to whoa, pull up something else. Um, so I have my own script. Um, and this is the problem with a portion of a shared screen. <laughs> um, where did that go? So let me read this and then I'll move through the slideshow while that link stays on the screen. Community Click Virtual is a real time companion web application that enhances online town meeting attendees engagement by allowing them to express themselves in real time, silently and anonymously without needing to speak up in a Zoom meeting. It is designed and developed by the HCI lab at UMass Amherst. Community Click Virtual allows attendees to provide feedback during the meeting by using a collection of customizable reaction options, such as agree, disagree, important, confused, and more. Attendees can also use a live chat option to provide detailed feedback or share opinions on the meeting agendas, topics, and discussions. The system also provides meeting organizers with analytics dashboard to control meeting settings and display real-time statistics on the ongoing attendee engagement. The organizers can also send public or private messages to respond to attendees' questions. Community Click Virtual was deployed first as, as a first town council deployment use on December 2nd, 2021 in a town services and outreach committee public hearing. At that time, there were 15 attendees in the meeting, all of whom used Community Click Virtual and 11 of them actively participated using Community Click Virtual's features. The engagement patterns and responses suggest that attendees were enthusiastic to participate and share their opinions. Because of that, we're attempting to do the same thing. We're going to be doing the same thing through, ah, that is not what I wanted, throughout, um, the process CRC has embarked on for getting to a revised residential rental bylaw. So the address has been up for a while. Um, let's, the next one is how you get in. Once you're at that address, you click I am an attendee. Um, you open the link in a new web browser and you can use your computer or phone. And once the page loads, you see this page and you select I am an attendee to participate. Once you've selected that, you'll select the meeting CRC residential rental license types. Um, when that gets selected, you will choose your location. The location is the only thing you must enter. Um, because this is a discussion on housing, it would be really nice if you <laughs> answered the housing question too, but they're, the only mandatory question is the location. Um, we're clarifying that your participation is completely anonymous and we do not collect or track any information that can be used to identify you in any way. Once you've answered those questions, the next screen you'll see is this screen that has this. And this is where you will participate as we go through this discussion. During the meeting, you can use the buttons to share your opinions. You can click agree, disagree. Tell us if you think something is important. Tell us if you think you're confused or unsure and let us know if you have other thoughts. If you click the small triangle, that will bring up this small triangle here. That will bring up a chat window, which will look like this. You can use the chat option to share your thoughts and opinions during the meeting by sending messages. Your message is private and only the organizers will be able to see your message during the meeting. You can use the triangle button again to close the chat window. So that is the extent of the slides and the mini tutorial on how to use Community Click. Um, we hope the attendees will use it. As I see more come in, um, I will attempt to again put up that, that slide and all so that we can see that um, so that others can join that too. Um, Shalini, you have your hand raised and welcome Shalini. Thank you. I just want to say I'm here and also just a very small minor uh, clarification, the new version, I believe, has instead of the triangle, it actually says chat. So I hope people just don't go looking for the triangle because it just says clicker. And then if you want to go and add a comment or see, um, you can click the chat button. Thank you for that clarification, yeah. Shalini. I tried to update the slides. Um, Pam. 
So I have a question. If someone is in the audience looking at that screen, do they just have to type that? Because you, that was not a live link. So I tried to copy it to paste it, but I guess someone would have to actually read it, write it yeah. down and type it in. Yes, you would have to type that in. It is also a link provided in the bulletin board notice for our meeting. So if you got to the bulletin board notice for the CRC meeting, um, there's the Zoom link there, but within the description is also that link to be able to click that directly. Or when I have that up, and I'll try to put that up a couple times during the meeting as I see if attendees increase, the, the um, QR code, just scanning that with your phone, will also then allow you to go right to that website without having to type the website in. Um, are there any questions about that before we actually begin our discussion on rental registration bylaw? Um, Oh, and, and for, for information, um, one of the UMass um, researchers, Mahmoud Jasmine, is in our panelist section. He is, he, is one of, he is one of the researchers, the head researcher that is doing this, and so he's there in case we've got any problems with it. Um, I asked him to be a panelist so that the communication with that, if, if need be, would be easier than if he was in the attendees. So for committee members, that is that that is the name you probably don't recognize and wondering who he is. Um, so we thank Mahmoud for being here um, to monitor and and hopefully gauge the participation of, of the attendees that we have. With that, um, we're going to move into the residential rental bylaw discussion. Um, today, I received an email from committee member Councillor Pam Rooney um, with some thoughts she had that she wished to be distributed to the committee. Um, I have been busy all day, so I did not see that and could not deal with it until right before this meeting. Um, and because it has some opinions and all in it, because it's a, a that, um, I needed to ensure that Athena could put it on the website before I put it in SharePoint. It is now on the website and it is also in SharePoint. I understand it is extremely late and therefore cannot necessarily be read immediately during this discussion um, or before it, um, but I am attempting to provide as much information as possible to everyone. This is not the only time we're going to be discussing all of this. Um, and so the point of today's discussion, my thoughts are to talk about what we want to see in bylaws relating to licenses types, license exemptions, who it should apply to, all of that, um, so that two weeks from now, we can come back and look at actual language and how that would look in language. So I don't want us to focus really specifically on language today. I want us to focus on a rental registration system. We'll start with you know, how many licenses or permits should we have different types, and then we'll move on to who should, be, who should, who should it be applicable to. And that includes, as you see in the sections C and D of the working draft, sections two and four of the current bylaw, do we exempt things like dorms? Do we exempt um, section eight housing? Do we exempt them from obtaining a license or permit and an inspection or just an in inspection? So that's sort of the exemption side. Um, what doesn't need a license? What might need a license, but not an inspection? And then the license side is, do we? how many types do we have? So with that, I'm gonna basically open up the floor um, for discussion. Um, it's now 4.45, around 5.15. I'd like us to move to public comment um, initially, and then we'll see if there's any public comment on all of this, and then we'll move back into discussion for us um, and all. And as I said, that's what I'm looking for to get an idea of what we should be putting in a draft bylaw and the draft language we'll come back with. That was a lot of words, <laughs> but Pam, <laughs> I'll start with you. So first of all, I do apologize for putting my thoughts on paper and giving to everybody late, but I just started to, you know, throw stuff down. And I think, you know, we're all starting with um, the same basic draft that was that was sort of put together by the sponsors. And it's a step in trying to, um, you know, just start pecking away at some of those sections. What went through my head though, as I was starting to do that is I wondered if it would be worth a very short discussion about what this bylaw ought to contain. And so I just asked myself, 
the following questions. Who needs this license? Who does, I mean, what, what, what does the bylaw really want to cover? So who needs this license? Who doesn't? How do I get one? How much does it cost? Inspection requirements. What if I don't pass inspection? What constitutes a violation and anything else? So in terms of categories of stuff, um, I think this pretty much reflects what is in that bylaw, but the bylaw is so detailed already um, that I wanted to just see if we could step back and just make sure that we're answering all of the right questions. So I'm open to ideas. Thank you, Pam. Before I go to Jennifer, I'd like to ask Rob, I see that John Thompson is in the attendees. John, Rob, would you like John brought in? Thank you. Um, Athena, can you bring John in? And, and I want to let the staff know here that it's not just a committee conversation. It's a, co a conversation with staff, too. So Rob, Chris, John, as we go through this, feel free to raise your hands, use the raise hand button and, and chime in. You don't have to wait till all committee members have spoken or anything. Um, consider everyone part of the conversation. <laughs> Jennifer, and welcome, John. <laughs> I, I just quick question are we um license is the same as a permit yes okay well uh, that's a question actually for rob do those terms have different connotations and is there is there a reason to pick one over another rob or john well at this point we've chosen permit so that's what we have done for the last several years so just for consistency and not to cause more confusion, I think that would be the only reason I'd suggest to stick with permit. Okay. Thanks. That's my only comment right now. Okay. Nope, that's fine. Shalini. Yeah, to add to the questions that uh, Pam was asking as we're thinking about the bylaw, uh, I just want to again remind us that uh, keeping that question, what are the problems we're solving for and what kind of behaviors sh do we want to promote? So this bylaw should be such that it gets people to be behaving more and more in line with the goals that we have and what kind of behaviors we want. So the, I would add that question to it. Um, if I may just add another. Yep. Point. Go right ahead, Shalini. Um, it's just that when we're thinking about the comparables, I think it makes sense to get look at other bylaws within Massachusetts because I believe the um, the tenant landlord by laws and state laws are different across different. So we can look, but just be try to get more um, examples of towns with the cities within Massachusetts. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah, that comment actually was brought up at a, a TSO meeting, I think by another counselor about not, you know, looking in Massachusetts. And I would push back a little on that because um, I think, yeah, we should look at Massachusetts, but also in other jurisdictions, because when we've looked at other jurisdictions, they have been jurisdictions that are usually home to a large state university. And there are actually a lot of books about college towns. It's almost like its own little subset of urban planning or urban studies. So I think we, you know, in many respects have more in common with other college towns, even if they're in other states than just another jurisdiction in Massachusetts. Um, and I think, yeah, we, you know, would have to be mindful if, if it's permitted in Massachusetts, but I think we'd really be limiting, limiting ourselves if we don't look at other jurisdictions, just like ECAT looks across the country, for examples. Um, we, we, one of the um, jurisdictions we have looked at is Salem, which has Salem State. And they actually have a good, I think, they, they have a good bylaw. Thank you. Um, one thing I'd like to start with in my mind is in looking at a bunch of the options, um, we saw a bunch of, some, some communities had a type one, a type two, a type three that were based on things like percent of violations in an inspection or um, percent of sort of, you know, criminal complaints 
and violations found during the course of the prior year. Um, and depending on how many those were, you got a license that might be three years, a license that might be two years, or a license that might be one year. Um, but then there's, in, in the working draft we had, and this was based on, in some sense, those differences, but also conversations that I had with members of the Board of License Commissioners about Airbnb type rentals. And I'm not going to use the word short term here because there's all different thoughts of short term. So I'll just call them Airbnb rentals, which in my mind are actually different than non Airbnb rentals, the sort of full residential rental. And do we want to have different licenses for those two types of rentals? Um, one thing the Board of License Commissioners um, Gaston de los Reyes pointed out to me is the Airbnbs need some sort of state business license. I don't know whether it's a license or some tax ID or something because they have to pay taxes to the state. And technically they have to pay taxes to us too because um, we've instituted that. And a license would allow us to, if they obtain one, to sort of check on that. And so I'd like to hear from the staff about does it make sense to have a separate permit or license for the Airbnb rentals over the other rentals? Um, because we could potentially require different things for them. And should that be in one bylaw? Michelle. Yeah, I was gonna add that as we begin to build the frame framework for this, I think it would be really helpful to hear from John in particular and from Rob um, about sort of what are the issues on the ground that are particular to Amherst that we should really be considering as we like at this very early stage. Um, because I, I think obviously looking at other bylaws, whether it's within our state or outside of our state is very important, but I think we really need to understand, as Charlene has said, the problems that we're trying to solve and um, specifically the problem within our community. And so I, I'm very grateful that John is here and uh, I, would, I would love to hear from him what he feels like the particular problems are in our neighborhood. In John, would you like to respond to that? Sure. Um, I can only stay for a few minutes. I'm sitting in front of First Church on Main Street waiting for a copper artisan to come talk about fixing the gutters. So um, I thought I'd tune in for a minute while, while I wait for him. Um, Particular problems with rentals. Um, I think it's a small set of rentals that we have a problem with here. And um, lately it's um, kind of one-off properties that are owned from, you know, by people that are from away. That's, that's, that's been it historically um, right from the beginning. And there seems to be um, quite a few properties in town that have recently changed hands and gone that way. Um, so often they're, they're places that already had a rental permit and the new owners don't know that that's even a, you know, a requirement. So I end up spending some time chasing. Thank you, John. Rob, do you have any comments right now? You're muted, Rob. Yes, I think that's a great question that Michelle asked, and I think we'll probably um, come back to that in almost every discussion. And you know, as it relates to the two sections that we're talking about today, um, I think we did a fairly good job of capturing all the um, the unit types that we wanted to originally uh, with the bylaw, and I don't I don't see anything really proposed here that's looking to do more. Um, except for one situation. So I just wanted to mention that if it seems like a good time to get into this uh, about the draft language. But um, in C1, um, we uh, 
and, and you kind of, you got to read these, you know, you got to read C, D and definitions all together to have it make sense. But in C1, um, it discusses and captures a rooming unit, uh, similar to what we have now in our bylaw, except that um, by definition, a rooming unit would be a boarding and lodging situation that's accessory to a dwelling. So uh, an owner occupied property that might be letting one or two rooms uh, would be captured by this uh, as a rooming unit. And it isn't in our current bylaw and it, and it was addressed in a way in our current bylaw that's kind of was confusing at first uh, until everybody understood what the language was really trying to say. But um, in our current bylaw, we say that uh, lodging and boarding houses that are operating as principal uses receive a permit and are subject to the bylaw, which by doing that, we exempted without saying as an exemption, we exempted the accessory uses. So I just wanted to note that uh, it's worth looking at that and reading it along with uh, some of the, the definitions uh, for residential rental property, uh, rooming house and rooming unit because those definitions try to exclude certain types of buildings. Uh, so, uh, you know, it makes me wonder, are those further exemptions like, uh, you know, a mobile home? Is that an exemption because it's excluded as a residential rental property? So it's just kind of making sense of, of the various pieces there. Um, I have, you know, I have other comments as we go through, through D, but that was my initial comment with, um, Section C. Thank you, Rob. Jennifer. Um, yeah, so I just wanted, you know, um, it, John, who I took, you know, well, before I was a counselor and I could just call staff directly, I called John all the time. He was incredibly responsive um, and he has an overview of the whole town. But I also feel like, you know, I'm, I have a lot of student housing. In, um, so I know from my experience, my, you know, constituents what some of the needs are. Um, I wish I could only had to ask John, but I don't because they're all around me. But some of the um, concerns in terms of what we're, and, and again, John's right. It's certainly, it's more the absentee landlords that aren't in town, you know, those that are right here. So, so you're absolutely right about that. But, you know, some of the, what we'd be looking for the owners to be responsible for, I mean, number one concern is overcrowding. And that, you know, even presents itself in too many cars, cars on lawns, you know, too many cars in the driveway. Um, you know, we would want landlords to be mindful of, you know, properties that on weekend mornings, you know, are kind of carpeted with beer cans. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I guess, and just, you know, taking some, responsibility, you know, for, which I, for, for noise, repeated noise and nuisance. I mean, I know on sunset, there are some houses like very close to the Gillens that are problems every weekend. Um, again, I, there's a lot of landlords that wouldn't tolerate that, but some, and, it, and in, the concern is increasingly, as John said, as more houses are bought by out of town investors, you know, there's, you know, there's just a big gap between who's living in the house and actually who's paying attention to what's going on there. So that's, you know, but, but how that, but so that's a part of what we're, a large part of what we're trying to address in, in the bylaw. Thank you, Jennifer. You know, in addition to just the fact that I think every town, everywhere, you know, you have to, having a rental property, you have to ensure health and safety for the tenants. So you, do have to get a permit or a license so that the jurisdiction, you know, can track what's going on and know that the houses are up to health and safety codes, you know, and that the town, the jurisdiction have some inventory of, of what house, you know, where, what number of rent units or rentals, where they are, how many people are living in them, because it really, it's, it's a business and it's also a real health and safety issue. Thank you, Jennifer. Michelle, your hand is still up. I've been bypassing you because I thought it was residual. Is it residual? I'm so sorry about that. Um, it was, but I actually do have a thought that I'll quickly add. Um, is there, it's actually a question. Um, is there a way to, or ha has anyone that's researched this seen 
a transfer of property ownership license or, or something that at the transfer of a property would um, create or trigger the need for some sort of registration. Rob um, or J John's shaking his head no, it looks like. Um, does Do either of you, Rob or John, know if we could put something like that in, I, I think we attempted in this draft, I know it's a different section of saying, you know, something about that at property transfers, the new, the purchasers must be notified of this bylaw based, you know, sort of that one was based on our um, right to farm notice, I guess is what it was. Is that something that would be logical to do? Was that something, John, that would help, you know, or Rob, that would help you tracking these down is that notice that says, hey, we have this. And if you're planning on renting it, you need to do this, Rob. Um, it, it could be. Um, so we actually do that now to a certain degree. So we, we get a report from the assessor's office on transfers monthly. John and I review that. Um, but we're trying to pick out the obvious, um, you know, exchanges that need our attention. So if we see an LLC or a name of, a, of an investor and property owner that we're familiar with, we reach out to them. Um, so that I think we do that to some degree and could take it to another level and make it just a, you know, a requirement. What we've, what we have found, because we have tested the kind of the blanket messaging we we do mass emailings we have sent letters um we get a lot of angry calls back uh from the people that are not participate not part of the program uh you know so we we decided instead of dealing with it that way and sending it to everybody we try to pick out the ones we think that it's subject to um so i think you know your method would probably capture more and make you know be more a better complete notice uh, so we should consider that, but, it, you know, just so you know, we've done that and it has been useful uh, in the way we've monitored it for the, you know, I don't know, dozen or less or fewer uh, exchanges that happen on a month to month basis. Thank you, Rob. And, and John looked like his uh, inspector or whatever came. So um, hopefully we'll be able to have John at these conversations regularly. Um, Chris and then Shalini. I just had a question which um, relates to something that Rob said before, and that is um, how much have the people who have been writing this been cross-referencing it with uh, zoning bylaw? And so for instance, there are different um, accessory uses in section article five of the zoning bylaw that allow homeowners to rent rooms in their homes um, and the house needs to be owner occupied. Um, and there are a couple of levels of that. One doesn't require any kind of special permit from anyone. Uh, that's up to three people that you can rent to. And the other one is, I think, four to six people where you do need to get a special permit. But I just um, wanted to suggest, in case you haven't done this yet, to take a look at um, the beginning of um, Article 5 accessory uses to see how what you're proposing here meshes with what is in the zoning bylaw. That's that is all. a fantastic suggestion. Um, in the working draft, which as I've uh, we've we've made clear or attempted to on many occasions is a very first rough draft. Um, when I was drafting the definitions, I attempted to cross-reference the zoning bylaw as much as I could and use those definitions or reference those permitted uses, especially with dorms and all. Um, so I think that's something we need to be doing more often so that we're not at cross purposes. Shalini. Um, so John has left, but maybe Rob can speak on his behalf because what John mentioned was that uh, there are a small set of rentals that create problems and could we get a sense of what are those problems? Rob? Yeah, um, you know, I think you, I think it's safe to say that you know, more than half of the complaints that John responds to has to do with uh, parking and trash, mm -hmm. furniture outside, visible, very clearly visible um, matters that um, are generally easily dealt with. 
so those are usually taken care of really quickly as soon as they're, um, you know, they're made aware of that. And then the other, you know, not as many, but, uh, you know, less than half of the complaints are uh, some type of code issue, fire, health, safety code. Um, those come to us a number of different ways, um, more often than before parents of students living in the, the dwelling units contact us and will ask us to arrange an inspection and, and their, their child will you know, meet us there and open, open the unit and have us walk through. Uh, so that's really a, you know, the bulk of the work. Um, we are, you know, again, I'll probably repeat this over and over, over again, complaint only. So uh, you know, at, as, although I'll agree with John, uh, you know, it's a small number of properties that we have that we would put into the category of having regular repeat issues with that we know too well uh, and, and know we're gonna be dealing with um, pretty much year to year. Uh, but that's only because we haven't seen all the properties. And, and I think, you know, to Jennifer's comments, I, you know, I agree with the, the priorities, maybe in a different order. Um, but, you know, when we talk about the health and safety of a unit and ensuring that, we can't ensure health and safety of a unit until we've seen it at least once because we are completely relying on information that's put into our application system. And, uh, you know, if John was here, I'd have him, you know, comment on this because it seems like weekly for me, working with John, that he's dealing with an issue that um, he's finding that the information isn't accurate. Number of bedrooms, number of occupants, um, just specifics about the unit itself. Um, you know, everybody's opinion on, you know, what is in compliance with it, with a code and, you know, is the person looking at it really qualified to make that decision? Uh, you know, the, the self-certification was an idea. It got us to this point, but it has its, you know, it has its flaws. Uh, so I know we'll talk about that more as we go into the inspection sections, but uh, hopefully that helps. Thank you. Anything else, Shalini? Yeah, I was just going to add that I think, you know, hearing from residents, from the town staff, and then also from property owners, like what are the challenges they encounter and, and from students, um, you know, hearing from all the different people who are involved in this ecosystem would be helpful. Thank you. Pam. Yeah, I would, I would say we certainly want to hear from all aspects of this issue. Um, um, I waited so long, I forgot my, my, uh, my comment. Um, oh, I was gonna say, um, so we, we could spend a lot of time talking about the, the background and the details and things like that, but I wondered if today's today's action is to kind of think about, um, and we've delved in the, in the conversation of, so who, who gets a license and who doesn't? And I think we've started to talk a little bit about who doesn't really need a license. And perhaps if we could, if we could tap um, Rob's brain as, as we're kind of going through that, maybe he could help remind us currently who does not get, I, he started to, and I didn't track it fast enough. Who doesn't need a license today per zoning or per today's um, code? And then let's talk about, you know, one by one, just categories and do we think that we should include them or not? Does that work for people? Yeah, um, that was actually where I was gonna move after I did public comment, because I think that's, that, that's a good segue into that. Um, before we go, we've got about five minutes before I try for public comment. Um, let's get some thoughts on should the license or the permits be separated into different types? Um, should, say, Airbnbs have a separate permit from non-Airbnb rentals? Um, so let's start with that and thoughts on that and should I know the working draft I think has a separate permit did, did it inc at one point the working draft had a separate permit for student rentals and then a, a, and other rentals I don't know whether the working draft still has that or not um because there's so many drafts out there but should those be separate too or not or or should not so thoughts on that Pam your hands are still up uh, it's, it's up again 
Um, it's, I mean, so that's, that's exactly what we're trying to get into. So now we're just separating off Airbnb from everything else. If Rob were to able, we're able to currently say what we, what we currently need a permit for, that'd be really helpful. And then we can figure out if there's anything missing that we think ought to have some kind of permit. Rob and then Jennifer. Okay, so we'll come back to we'll come back to permit types then. So the right the 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 permit is required currently is required for any rented dwelling unit with just a few exceptions. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, just the way we kind of crafted that language, the lodging and boarding house that's accessory to a dwelling unit that Chris also mentioned does not require uh, a permit. So that's that's um, any owner occupied home that might be letting out rooms, uh, that one would not require a permit. And then the other exceptions that are listed in section four of the, uh, of the bylaw, uh, the current bylaw um, are really the only exceptions, you know, the group homes, the halfway houses, the uh, congregate living uh, arrangements that are licensed by the Commonwealth. Um, the one that's not listed there that I don't make that I made a decision way back because I thought it should have been listed there is uh, door and I and I wrote it into my bylaw so I'll just read what I had written in years ago. Um, dormitories owned and operated by an educational institution and located in the educational district shown on the official town zoning map. And that's just the way I wrote it for myself um, because when that question came up initially, you know, it, it, was, it didn't seem worth revising the bylaw so quickly. And that's just the way that I, uh, you know, applied that moving forward. So off campus, off um, outside ED district in our residential districts, Amherst College owns properties. Of course, we know there's privately owned uh, buildings, those all receive permits, but the ones within the ED district don't. Uh, so that's about it. That's about it. That's what we currently, um, you know, work with for uh, applicability and exemptions. That's all. Oh, and by the way, we only have one boarding house that is a principal use. So when we said principal use boarding houses receive a permit, there's only actually one that's a legal non-conforming uh, property. The one in Mon the one in North Amherst. Uh, I I wish John was here. I I'm not sure of the address. Thank you, Rob. Jennifer. Yeah, I am curious. So Airbnbs, I would think they would. Are they a business? I would think they would have a different. I would think they're a different animal than another rental. I mean, isn't that like operating a business? So Rob, Airbnbs technically fall under needing a permit currently, right? Under this bylaw, under the current bylaw. The current bylaw does not, um, we do not require Airbnb um, um, to get permits. And I think that when you look at all, you know, you, you have a bunch of drafts in your, in your packet of other communities. I think they address it mainly by consecutive days of rental. So I think it does make sense to draw, you know, create a different permit for the Airbnb, which is generally less than 30 days uh, of rental. Um, and then, you know, on the flip side of that, you know, I had always thought maybe it's worth exploring properties that have long term tenants, you know, and treating those properties uh, in some other way. And I think there's other categories, you know, as you start to talk about this more. Um, properties that are monitored or inspected by some federal agency like HUD or um, housing authority inspection programs. Um, that gets complicated because not all the units are always associated with those programs. So we have to think about that, but there might be, um, you know, at least two or three categories in addition to the, you know, everything rental, everything else that's a dwelling unit that's rental. That might be treated a little bit differently, fewer inspections, maybe no inspections, uh, and possibly different fee structure. Thank you, Rob. Um, Jennifer, and then yeah, Shalini. So yeah. No, I'll just continue on that. So I, um, so I, yeah, I mean, I, I, not that we would um, necessarily give a different permit, but I, 
I think it would be very useful information for, and I don't see why any property owner would, would care. I mean, because if to, to be able to keep track of what are the student houses and what are being rented to non-student households, just so the town has a sense of what's going on. And, you know, I mean, people that rent to students are very upfront about it. I don't, can't imagine anybody not, you know, wanting to disclose that information. But I also think, you know, as we get, as we're looking more into, you know, the housing we have, you know, rental units, as well as all others for, you know, our long-term non, you know, sort of student households, it would just be good to see really, you know, who's living here. I mean, or, you know, who, who, who do we, are we providing housing for who needs housing? So I just don't see why we wouldn't want that information. Thank you, Jennifer. Shalini, and then we're going to move to public comment on this agenda item. Yeah. Uh, would Rob mind answering maybe that question? Like, why would it, would it be easy to manage? Like, what are the challenges in having a different license for students? What are the pros? And, I mean, the pros, I think I can see since we're hearing that a lot of complaints are coming from houses with, over, with beer cans or noise and all of that so wouldn't it make sense like jennifer saying to have a separate license so that it'll be easier for inspection purposes maybe later on i, was so saying, I don't know whether it has to be a separate license just a note of whether it's a student a note. yeah yeah just yeah so what are the obstacles to doing something like that or negatives um, The, the challenges really are, how do you maintain the record of that and, and ensure that it's accurate? Um, and I'm not sure how we do that. You know, I've thought about this, um, you know, sometimes it's easy to, to see and, and pretty clearly understand that a property is rented to students and sometimes it's not. Uh, so we would be leaving it up to the applicant to tell us you know, and we would be establishing a license that basically gives them, you know, gives them the ability to rent it as a student rental. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. Uh, maybe every unit in the property isn't a student occupied by a student. So it will get really challenging to try to break that down and know accurately what it is. But, um, you know, it's, and I'm not sure that I think that there's a, what the value is in that. So if we have these license types like Airbnb and possibly something that is um, clearly understood, regulated by HUD inspection program and everything else, whether it's a student or not a student rental property um, is, is going to be much easier for us to manage um, accurate, at least accurately year to year. Um, but in any case, it seems like it'd really be reliant on what the app, what the application, the, the, the information put into the application process and really no way of knowing um, if, that's, if that's correct or uh, changes from year to year. Thank you. I'm gonna ask Jennifer and Michelle to hold their comments and Chris too, to hold your comments. Um, we're gonna go to the public and then we'll come back because I don't wanna put the public comment in the middle of this. We found it in prior CRC meetings that it's helpful to have it in the middle and then come back and, and, and continue the conversation. So um, members of the public who wish to um, make public comment regarding this particular agenda item, residential rental bylaw, and in particular, it would be helpful if it sticks to license types, license exemptions, student home issues and things like that, um, so that we try and stay a little bit on topic. Please raise your hand right now and I will recognize you in turn. Um, and everyone will have three, up to three minutes to respond. We're going to start with the um, individual who was signed in as Green Miles Lipton. Please um, unmute yourself and state your name and where you live and um, then make your comment. Thank you. My name is Michael Hill. I'm an attorney. You see Green Miles Lipton because that's a law firm where I am a partner. Um, at the beginning of April, Shalini sent me the draft and asked me, in effect, um, what thoughts did I have on how to improve that? Um, that is a subject that has been close to my heart most of my life. 
my second year of law school, I quit the law review to uh, help start a student tenant organization and start a tenant legal services program. Uh, if anybody knows about legal education, you have some idea what kind of a career fork in the road that was, and I've never regretted it. So I put in between two and three days write, researching and writing a memorandum. Uh, it came to about seven or eight pages that I sent to Shalini. I don't know if that's been forwarded to anybody else. Um, that's That in a nutshell is my input. Since I have only three minutes, I would respectfully request that you please read that, okay? I have a lot of experience drafting local bylaws uh, in the, my hometown of Shutesbury. I am doing this on a pro bono basis. In a nutshell, um, I suggest first and foremost, um, make it more obvious how to request an inspection today. Second, um, and this is Rob's point, it seems that your focus is going from self-inspection to inspection. You need to have a narrow focus. At the beginning of the memo, I emphasize keeping it simple. Um, begin by improving and pulling together your enforcement, your legal framework. I discussed that in the memorandum. Have specific achievable goals. And number one is going from self-inspection to inspections everywhere else. Jennifer Taub mentioned Salem, uh, maybe a coincidence. That is the one bylaw I attach to my memorandum. Um, I have a master's degree in urban planning. Early in my career, I was a visiting assistant professor of urban planning teaching land use law. So what Jennifer said is correct. It sometimes is very helpful to go to other states. On the other hand, I emphasize the need to be very, very careful. Massachusetts has one of the most well-developed tenant legal frameworks of any state in the nation, and you need to focus on that. For example, the draft bylaw refers to rules, regulations generally. I tried to pull out and put in that memo just about everything. You need specific citations. Um, also, there's very little premium in originality, okay? Um, with your definition sections, please look at chapter 64G, section one, capital G of the Mass General Laws. A lot of the terms are defined in that section. Uh, one does not want to reinvent the wheel or bite off more than you can chew when it comes to um, legislation. And what I, I would urge you to do is start with the points that Rob and John have made and start with the Salem bylaw and see to what extent you can adapt from that because that bylaw like the ones in other towns have track records. Rob can talk or John can talk to the public officials in those towns, find out what works, what doesn't, what good experiences have they had and what, uh, what would they want to change in that bylaw. Um, all I can say is, you know, I probably put $5,000 worth of time into writing that memo, which I'm very happy uh, to do, okay? This has been a subject close to my heart all my life. My master's thesis in planning was on uh, housing. So um, I don't wanna keep other people from speaking or go over the three minutes, which I hope I haven't done. Um, also, if there's anything else I can do to assist um, as a citizen, um, and as somebody who in this case happens to have some legal training and a fair amount of experience going back about 40 years in drafting local bylaws, I'm glad to do whatever I can to uh, uh, function as a resource for you folks. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Janet McGowan, please unmute yourself, state your name and where you live and make your comment. Um. My name is Janet McGowan. I live at 706 Southeast Street. Um, I I'm, want to speak more generally um, to support what Michelle Miller um, brought up, which is to, to really identify what the problems that the CRC or the town council is trying to solve and to understand what the issues are for renters, um, student and non-student renters, and the people living in neighborhoods with a lot of student rentals. Um, 
so I, I've gone door to door and I've been inside apartments where my um, son's friends were renting. They were UMass students. And I was pretty taken aback at the really poor quality of the, the rentals. I'm a landlord myself. And I think that, you know, students don't advocate for themselves. They're in a very tight housing market. There are not a lot of options. They don't know what the code is. Um, they're also paying really high rents. And I also have friends who have been looking for apartments to stay in Amherst when they've sold their house or their family lives have, have changed, who haven't been able to find good quality rental apartments in Amherst um, because of the poor conditions and the rents are very high. So they've, they've moved out of town. And so I think the goals, like what are the problems that you're trying to solve? And I think the problem is really poor, some very poor quality rental apartments at high rents um, and you know student behavior. And it's not saying all students behave in a negative way, but when you have a neighborhood that's dominated by student rentals, you, you know it, you can see it and the people living there suffer from that. I think the goal, overall goal, is to keep neighborhoods strong and stable and to have good quality rentals in Amherst. Um, I think you have to gather information from year-round residents living in student neighborhoods, student-dominated neighborhoods. We need to look at other college towns, for example, talk to the planning director, see how things work. We need to talk to students. And actually, you should go look at their apartments. Um, you know, I'm sure they would have you in and also non-student renters because they have a different situation and also to landlords, um, large and small. I think until you really see what is happening on the ground in people's neighborhoods, I've seen videos of hundreds of students walking down Fearing Street, people you know, passing out. It's like hard to imagine, you know, I live next to a rental house. I have rentals in my neighborhood. We don't have that behavior, you know, but if you live in a neighborhood like that, you're, diff you're gonna have a very different experience. I've heard people talking about that. I've seen neighborhoods in Amherst go from being a mix of owners and student renters and non-student renters to rent, you know, student rental neighborhoods and they sort of get written off and it seems to be sort of spreading. So I really think this work you're doing is really important but we need to have, be very grounded in what's happening in neighborhoods. What are people's experiences? And I think they just, you have to talk to them. Um, so thank you for your work. I, I think this is this is the issue for Amherst, basically one of the key issues for us. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Seeing no other comments at this time, we're going to move back to committee conversation. There were three hands up before we moved to that. It was, um, I think, Shalini and Jennifer and Chris Brestrup, although Michelle might have been up Michelle. too. Yeah, and Michelle. <laughs> okay, and Michelle. There were a bunch up. So Jennifer and then Shalini and Michelle and Chris. Um, yeah, I'm just a little, I guess when I'm, you know, I'm about student, you know, just keeping having some inventory or what, what's a student house. Um, you know, some college towns do, I think, maybe have a student um, house license. I don't know that we have to have a separate license. I just think, you know, everything that's on the application is the property owner, you know, putting what's on, you know, filling it out. So it, if you know, if the question was asked, you know, are you renting to students or who's living here? I mean, it would be as accurate as anything else. Um, and then if they renew the license or the, they have to get a permit every year, they just, you know, that's how we'd know from year to year what was going on. But I just think it's, you know, it would be good information to have just to kind of know who's living here and who's renting. It doesn't seem like it would, we, it would be burdensome. So that might be something to discuss as a requirement for an application instead of a license. Um, right. When we get to the application questions sort of things. Exactly. Um, yeah, so um, I'm happy to share the letter that I got. Um, and so just send it to you, Mandy Jo. Um, yes, send it to me and I will put it in um, the packet for everyone for the Actually, I can put it in today's packet um, okay. and then I'll probably carry it over to the next packet too. Okay, and um, the question was, um, I'm trying to figure out what, what, um, what is the rental registration, how can the rental registration bylaw deal with the challenges we're having with, let's say noise and nuisance or, um, 
And so is that something that needs to be enforced by the noise and nuisance bylaw, by the new Crest Department? Uh, or is that something to be dealt by? I mean, I think the inspection part could somehow be maybe involved, but is it really a rental registration and inspection issue or is it a new or is it a nuisance bylaw issue? Um, yeah. That is a good conversation, not for the types of licenses. I'll make a note of that okay. for yeah. um, when we get into, you know, inspections and um, the the requirements to obtain a license, not what type of license it is. Right. Um, okay. I think is where that conversation that would comes go. in. Okay. And then the question about licenses, is it legal to have different types of licenses? And then I think I do want to get a sense of, um, why are we not doing an Airbnb license or like, I mean, there's a whole list over here, like the dorms. Um, and I think Rob already mentioned that dorms are exempted from licenses when they're on campus, but when they're not, when they're not on campus, are dorms and frat houses exempt? So dorms cannot be located anywhere but in the educational district under our zoning uh, bylaw, if I'm correct. Uh, and frats cannot be located frats. anywhere but un, in the residential really? fraternity zone under our bylaw. Right, Rob? Uh, not exactly. So okay. we do have um, mm -hmm. we do have a couple locations where privately owned dormitories can be built. And we have you know mm -hmm. Olympia Place, and we have another one that'll be constructed oh. next to that. Uh, Amherst College has a number of properties that are in the RG district that they register. I think they register, you know, somewhere around 20 properties annually, uh, and they vary in size. Uh, they're not all dormitory size buildings, but um, sororities and fraternities. So we have 11 pre existing non conforming off campus sorority fraternities, and those do register and receive a permit every year in addition to other inspections that we require, you know, we require there because of their particular use, but they are also part of the, uh, the permitting program now. Thank you. Um, Pam, you wanted to go to exemptions. So I know you had a comprehensive list in the document you provided that's in the packet that included a lot of what was in the working draft, but also some others. Um, so why don't you, Start with the first one on that, um, and then we can get Rob's take on whether that should be included in a license or exempt from a license, and then we can just go on um, and, and have sort of a short conversation on each one of those. Um, Shalini, your hand is still up. Is that just lingering? And before Pam starts, I just saw Michelle's hand, so I want to take Michelle, and then we'll, we'll go through that list that Pam came up with and get some thoughts on it. So Michelle? Um, since we started talking a little bit about student housing, um, I, I, Mandy, if you could make a note, I wonder if it would be worth exploring what mechanism or jurisdiction we would even have to ask our educational institutions, so the university, Amherst College, um, to get to get them to have students register with the town when they are going to be living off campus. So we have another way of keeping track of students who are living off campus. And I know that probably seems like maybe a little bit uh, far-fetched, but I, I think that students do a lot of registering when they start school each year and they're registering for their classes and they're registering for this and that. And I wonder what options we might have uh, for them to also have to register to be an off-campus uh, resident. Thank you, Michelle. So Pam, let's see if we can get through that list in 25 minutes and kind of come to some sort of agreements or thoughts on some stuff. Ready to rock. Um, I did want to just say, though, in response to Shalini's comment, that um, there are we have we have a number of ordinances, including noise and and nuisance. But I think what we're trying to do is help the um, 
the building inspector and the and the and the inspector services to be able to link those kinds of complaints and issues with the opportunity to deny a a rental permit. And until we have uh, sort of a package put together, we don't really have any tools that 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 we can enforce. So 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 on to the list of exemptions. Um, according to what we heard from Rob, we do have um, already exempted. We have lodging facilities such as hotels, motels, inns, hostels, and the bed and breakfast. I think we could leave and come back to later, okay? Because that's a bigger conversation. Um, the next item that I think he mentioned was uh, halfway houses and group homes. Um, and those are residential facilities op authorized and operated under Commonwealth and federal law, congregate or similar housing for the elderly or disabled, halfway houses for persons with substance abuse problems, congregate living arrangements for persons with disabilities or other similar housing facilities operated under license, under license by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, the next one is uh, that, that I, actually added is dwellings owned and operated by the Commonwealth or Amherst Housing Authority if these are otherwise already inspected. And I think we could come back to, is there some other mechanism for inspecting other than this bylaw? The next one was um, section eight vouchers whose vouchers are administered by the Amherst Housing Authority and are within residential rental property located in Amherst. And again, if these are inspected otherwise or are part of a complex that gets regular inspection, it would, it would definitely be. Uh, um, so do we want to stop, pause there, or are there other sort of the state ones on that list before we pause and take them as a... One more well, state, there's okay. one state one, and that's university owned or private college owned dormitories. And I liked Rob's um, wording much better, but this is just me trying to get down something that would be exempted if they're owned and operated and in the ED zone. So that's a list of, I, th I think I got five on there, hotels, motels, inns, B&Bs, and those B&Bs, Rob, are B&Bs as principal uses. Um, so that's different than the Airbnb rent out a room type thing. Um, it sounds like Rob thinks those should continue being exempted from this bylaw. Um, they were in the prior one. Any thoughts on not, you know, if we can move quickly. Should we keep those exempted from a rental registration bylaw? Chris. I have a question about the Section 8 vouchers because don't Section 8 vouchers go with the tenant and not with the property? So you could live at Rolling Green and you could be a student. You could live at Rolling Green and you could have a Section 8 voucher and live there as a family. Um, so I'm not sure what the point is of exempting Section 8 vouchers um, from this um, bylaw. Thank you. Rob. So I, I agree with Chris, um, and I, so I think three and four should not be exemptions of the permit. Uh, I think, you know, we can address in inspections how to, you know, deal with those properties appropriately if they do get uh, some sort of inspection. We'd also like to understand what type of inspection it is. And um, I think, as I mentioned earlier, it's not always every unit in a complex, uh, you know, that gets that inspection. Certainly not every unit that has uh, a voucher holder. Uh, and as Chris mentioned, they move around uh, sometimes. Uh, so I would suggest three and four are not exemptions uh, to the permit. Well, that would, be, that would be those operated by Amherst Housing Authority in the section eight. That's right. Okay. And, and that potentially they could have a different inspection requirement, but they'd still need a permit is sort of where you're thinking at this point for those two, right? I, I am. And I mean, interestingly, we do actually uh, a fair amount of response to uh, properties in those categories. So I, you know, I'm not, you know, really 
anxious to just exempt them yeah. uh, because we do we, we serve a purpose for the tenants in those units. Uh, sometimes they're very different issues than what we deal with uh, in other cases, but uh, we have a health inspector that really focuses on that type of work. Thank you. Um, Michelle. Yeah, Rob, just following up on that and Chris as well, um, isn't there a distinction between a property that is, say, managed and fully occupied by residents who hold vouchers versus uh, a resident who has a mobile voucher that is living somewhere else and what the housing authority is doing is really just case management for that resident. Aren't there, aren't there, isn't there a distinction between those two things? Rob? Yes, so that, that exists. So there's, there's properties that are owned, managed, operated uh, by the housing authority. And then there are uh, uh, voucher holders that um, the program is administered by the housing authority, but those tenants are located in Colonial Village or presidential apartments or any, anywhere uh, throughout town. Uh, so yes, there is um, there's certainly a difference in those properties. The, you know, the main thing that we look for is the on-site presence of a management team. And some of those have it, some of those don't in, in both situations. Yet you would okay. still want both those situations to obtain permits. So like Ann Whalen, you'd still want to obtain that rental permit, but then maybe deal with inspections differently? I would, because I think the criteria that we'll want to decide whether or not we conduct an inspection or how often we conduct an inspection um, won't fit every property solely because who owns it or who operates it. So I think we I think we're better off to include them all in the, and these, the, all these properties have been in the program for, uh, you know, since 2014. So I think they should continue in the program and we would talk about whether or not inspections occur and how those occur. Okay. Dorms, Rob, you sort of added it. I don't know whether that's informally or not to the current one. So dorms are not at least university college owned dorms are not required to register for the permit. Would you recommend keeping that exemption? I would recommend, yes, putting that exemption into the, the proposed bylaw, yes. Any other comments on those five before we move on with Pam listing a whole bunch of others? See none, Pam. <laughs> okay, then. I don't know the wording for a sanctioned um, sorority house or fraternity house. I know there were there are unsanctioned people living together in in rental units that are in fact fraternity members but aren't in the sanctioned house. So we're talking about sanctioned ones that I understand get biannual, full fledged uh, it, um, inspections by the town already. So we would we would exempt them. Um, we talked about this earlier, the owner-occupied dwellings containing up to six residential rental units in that same structure. These are not six different structures. These are all in one building if it's owner-occupied. And we have an example in North Amherst of that. And I don't know if we need to spell this out quite so specifically. Um, um, an ADU, uh, or um, or the main house where one unit is owner occupied, and I don't know if Rob, you already have something that covers that category. Okay, we'll stop there. Um, so the, those were an additional three to talk about. Let's start with sorority for fraternity houses. I assume the sanctioned Pam's referring to means um, given a use under the zoning code of sorority or fraternity. And Rob, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, so we uh, we permit those now, and I think we should continue to permit those and not exempt them. Oh, okay. You know, thinking back why we started this program, it, it was to uh, uh, identify where these properties are, who the responsible parties are, um, establish emergency contact for them. We don't have any other program that does that. 
even though, as you mentioned, we do go in there with an inspection team twice a year. Uh, that's something that was established a long time ago and has just continued to be part of our periodic inspection program. And, and we're glad we're able to do that, but um, it isn't connected to any particular pro program. Uh, so I think we should keep these properties uh, in the program and we do have issues at those houses uh, occasionally, uh, not all of them, and having a, a permit that hopefully someday is something that could be uh, at jeopardy to lose might be a tool that we would want to have available to us um, in the few and rare instances uh, on, on those properties. Uh, we consider those pre-existing non-conforming for zoning purposes, so they're not allowed by the zoning code today uh, to be created, or um, if they're expanded or changed in any way, it's a process with, to review with the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, and some of those do operate under the conditions of a special permit, and some of them don't uh, because they've just been there uh, in the same, uh, operated the same uh, fashion for so many years before the zoning uh, bylaw restricted them. Thank you, Jennifer and Chris. First, Jennifer, then Chris on. Yeah, I mean, just health. quickly, I guess, just, confirm, you know, um, yeah, you know, glad to hear that Rob's, you know, would like to, you know, keep that in the system. I guess I was just thinking of an example. I sit in on the campus and community coalition meetings. And just last week, John Thompson was sharing with the group that they had inspected that day of fraternity. And really, the, the kids, they probably didn't know, but they had dismantled all the um, smoke alarms. And I guess... One of them, it's he, he sat down with them and said, you know, it's actually a felony. You're not allowed to do this. They were kind of shaken up. They didn't have any idea. Just so, I mean, it's really for the safety of the students. It's really a very good thing that they remain in the inspection system. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Um, so we just passed an ADU bylaw and our ADU bylaw does require that um, the rented unit be uh, have be in compliance with the re residential rental property bylaw. So um, I don't see a reason for exempting those units since we just you know considered this carefully last year and established that they should be part of the um, the rental bylaw. Um, so, so thank you, Chris, for that. Um, my understanding before before I get to Pam, because I I, I want to talk about these two specifically, but I I would like to hear first from Rob or Chris. Our ADU bylaw now requires that one of the two units on the property be owner occupied, and so if 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 we were to talk about the two that Pam listed, owner occupied up to six units and ADUs, ADUs are actually a subset under our bylaw of owner occupied. So these are really the same sort of potential exemption. Is, is that correct? So that we can just sort of talk about owner occupied units as an exemption without splitting out the two. Is, is that correct, Rob or Chris? Yeah, I, I agree. Not, I think seven includes eight, yes. Okay. But so, if you were to change if you were to exempt ADUs, then you'd have to change the zoning bylaw. And the other category, I don't think we actually have a a use category that. So I would um, like, and I know these two listings were added by Pam. They were not in a working draft, so they're a new proposal, Pam. And so I'd, I'd like to hear, before I hear from other ones, you're thinking around not requiring an actual permit from um, owner-occupied units instead of some sort of, as we've talked about others, there's there's a permit issue and then there's an, a potential inspection issue. So can you talk about what you were thinking about as to why owner-occupied units wouldn't, you, you didn't think they needed a rental permit? So we've heard from a lot of people, I've heard from a number of people that um, are concerned about the fee structure. So right now we're, we're not talking about fees, but we wanted to be able to differentiate between owner occupied and and absentee or not owner occupied uh, units. And so I had forgotten that the ADU bylaw 
requires now a rental permit for the non-owner occupied portion of it. Um, I wasn't, I was thinking that perhaps, again, we would, we would want to encourage, um, we would want to encourage the opportunity for people to do ADUs and not get bogged down in any kind of a rental permit for their, their other, um, other half of the, of the property. Brings up the question though, that because we have um, difficulty with tracking rentals and, you know, you have to, you have to register to, to be tracked. Um, does that cause a problem? Does it cause a problem in the, in the tracking system? Well, could you register without having to pay? Well, well that, that's a potential possibility of, you know, a, a, a fee structure that addresses some of these um, and all. So Jennifer, further comment? Well, just I, right, I believe now, right, if you're an owner occupied, you know, if you're an owner renting, you don't have to pay a permit fee. Isn't that correct, Rob? Now, do you have to register? I mean, I th we think you'd have to register because the town, again, you still have tenants. So you have to ensure how, you know, that it health and you're up to health and safety standards, I guess you probably do and even if you're not renting, but so I would think you'd want an owner occupant to register. So you have that house as a house that's being rented, but now they don't, pay a fee, isn't that correct? Which I think is good. Because we, they wanted to encourage owner occupancy, which is why the initial bylaw didn't charge owner occupants for a fee, but I thought they still had to somehow register so they were part of the inventory of rental properties. Rob? Owner occupied properties that have more than one unit do require registration and the permit and pay the fee. They're not exempt. Uh, the only exemption is if the uh, it's a single unit that the owner is renting rooms within their dwelling unit that is owner occupied. But if there's a second unit, it requires a permit and they pay the fee. I guess I was thinking of the former where it's in their house that they're living in. So if, if you're renting in your house, do you do anything? If you're renting in your house, if you're renting rooms in your house, sharing kitchens, sh right. sharing the home, you do nothing. You don't do nothing. Okay. So then, then I would suggest that we take off the owner occupied dwellings with an ADU and up to six units and just take those out if we, if we have determined that. Um, so number seven and number eight of this memo could just get stricken. So I've, I've noted that we'll likely require a permit for them, but we might want to think about a different fee structure for them or potentially even a different inspection structure um, for that type of unit. Yeah. Um, next on your list, Pam. Let's see, next on my list. Um, I think this was a carryover from the other one. Dwelling units uh, located within residential properties that have been issued a circuit certificate of occupancy within the last three years. I, I, I didn't actually understand this. I carried it over from, from the previous version. Um, I don't think having a, a recent CFO is any reason to not get a permit. <laughs> no, I, yeah. Uh, I'll speak to that. I think that that was, again, might be an inspection thing of if they've been issued a certificate of occupancy, they were just built, they probably don't need a new inspection. But again, as you say, we probably want the permit. Rob, thoughts on that permit, but maybe consider different inspection requirements? Uh, I would say definitely the permit. And I think, you know, whatever we use for criteria in establishing the inspection requirements or duration between inspections would be the same whether the building was built three years ago or 20 years ago. I think, you know, when, when you, we look at sanitary conditions, it really doesn't matter how old the building is. Certainly the, the building systems hopefully are in good shape and being maintained three years later, but uh, I'm not sure that's, that would be, you know, alone a reason to, uh, you know, change an inspection schedule. 
could so we could strike this one as well because I the question was this really appears to just be an, an inspection issue. Um, number ten was short term residential property rented less than fourteen days, and again this I think goes to the Airbnb thing and it's another whole topic. So maybe we skip over this one and go to number eleven. Um, this is this is uh, from another from another jurisdiction, but it's sort of, you know, if you sell your house and you're allowed to stay there for another couple of months, all things clear, you don't actually have to get a, re a rental permit. I had no problem with that. Um, then, then there's the next one, which is 12, which is if you have a house sitter and you're not paying, if that house sitter is not paying to live in your house, um, and the owner res resides in a dwelling a minimum of a half a year, then there is no permit required. So let's take those. Those are, we'll, we'll start with um, rentals between house sales. I think that one's currently in our current bylaw, Rob, as, as sort of an exemption from needing a permit. What are your thoughts on that one? So that's not in our bylaw. What's in our bylaw now is um, a, a, a short term leave uh, of an owner occupant for, you know, work, uh, other reasons up to six months, uh, but with the intention to come back and occupy the home again. So that's what's in our bylaw and that doesn't require a permit. Uh, that actually now requires what is just a registration. Is, is how the bylaw is, is created. Um, I don't, I mean, I don't have a problem with this situation. I'm just not sure if it needs to be addressed in the bylaw, if there's, you know, but I don't, I don't, I think if someone told me this was happening, I'd probably say, all right, we'll check in in six months and make sure you're gone and that we have a permit on it. I don't think I would get too worried about it if that was happening. Uh, and, you know, I think right now, one of the things that we run into a lot because we don't have language, uh, you know, like some of these other draft bylaws do about actually collecting rent. So if we're not, you know, if there isn't money exchanged and we get asked that pretty often, uh, you know, we say it's not a rental, you know, just by kind of plain meaning definition. So I think that, um, you know, maybe that would be the case in a situation like this. Unless the, unless the new bylaw addresses that differently, I'm happy to I'm happy to strike number eleven. You know, if it's already if it's already as long as we include the whatever the current language is, um, and then the last one is sort of a takeoff on the same on the same concept, where you have a house sitter. It's basically if you're not renting, it is not a rent. If you're not collecting money, you're not renting. So we could strike. In my mind, we could strike 11 and 12. Well, well, striking is, is so, so yeah, the house center sitter, what Rob would say is he wouldn't consider that a rental anyway. And so it doesn't need listed as an exemption as long as we're, yeah. Right. Depending on how we define things, right? We just take these right off the full list. So we could go back to the short-term rentals. I, I have, we, we have the short-term rentals um, and, and then I have one other one. Um, and so let's start with short-term rentals. That definition came from the Board of License Commissioners draft changes to this. So I don't know whether Rob, you put input into that of their intention was to change this to make clear that Airbnbs that rent their rooms for over 14 days a year do have to get a permit, but if you do it less than 14 days a year, you don't need to get a permit, I think was was be the board's intent. Um, Rob, thoughts on sort of those Airbnb short-term rentals that are a day or two at a time, lots of people coming through, and when should they have a permit, when shouldn't they? Yeah, so I, you know, I'm definitely aware of what the Board of License Commissioners was working on and supportive of what they were, you know, talking about uh, for a possible amendment to the bylaw. And I, I thought it was good. I thought it was, you know, drawn the line, you know, they picked 14 days, it really doesn't matter, you know, pick a number of days. 
where it's a occasional, maybe last minute, uh, depending on what is going on for events in the town. You know, a lot of things could happen that would be nice to be able to have this exemption and not really worry about it. And then there's the the properties that do it, you know, more regularly as part of a business, you know, and and uh, you know are and don't have a presence. Uh, you know, the owner doesn't have a presence or uh, management have a presence uh, with the property. And I think that should be captured in the the permit and part of the program. So I was fine with it. Uh, you know, I don't have a strong opinion on 14 day, days versus 21 days or 30 days, but I think the, the concept is good. So uh, CRC members, um, thoughts on 14 days longer, shorter, where, where are thoughts on should we just go with the BLC number on does 14 days sort of capture the the difference potentially between those that are doing it as a business versus those that are just occasionally saying, oh, hey, it's a busy weekend and I can right. make some money once a year on it um, that we might not want to, to pull in. Um, do you think 14 days is is sort of a good number to pick? I would defer to Rob. Yes, I was. I was okay. going to ask: Is there any way to track it? You know, if it's fourteen or thirty, is do you have any way of tracking this, Rob? Probably not tracking it, but um, if there were suspicions of some a property being used beyond that, yes, we can. You know, we could investigate that and and react to it. Um, so, you know, without any other, you know, strong opinions on that, I would, I would say that the Board of License Commissioners probably spent a lot of time talking about this and thinking about it. And I would probably just go along with their recommendation. Thank you. Um, I have one other one, which Rob touched on and, and all, um, which is the rental of rooms within a home. Um, you know, right now, I guess you don't need a permit for that. As, as Rob said, if, if I were, you know, I have a four bedroom home, if I wanted to rent one of those rooms out to someone for an entire year, I wouldn't need to get a permit. What are the thoughts on that versus requiring someone to get a permit for that? Shalini. Or Sorry, you know, I a comment to on something else too is fine. <laughs> no, 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 let's first stay with your question. Can you repeat that? I got distracted yeah, with my own so, question. So Sorry. right now, it's my understanding from what Rob said that um, if I were to rent a room in my house to someone, I, I live in a single family home, so it's one unit, I'm owner occupied, but I wanted to rent out one or two rooms, you know, because they're not being used and hey, I could make money doing it. I don't need a permit to do that. Um, from, from what I've heard, I think the working draft bylaw might require that permit, um, but the current bylaw does not. And so what are, what are the thoughts on whether someone in that situation needs to get a permit or not? And Rob and Chris, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that too, but Pam and then Jennifer and then Rob and all, yeah, Pam. Um, to me, it feels like uh, it's it's a different scenario when there is someone renting a room in your house, which we did for eight years with a graduate student, and um, you are responsible for your home just as you normally would. If it's a separate, uh, and that person lives in your house and probably uses your kitchen, but if you um, if you have a separate dwelling unit, you have much less control and management. Um, of how that, that space is treated unless somehow you have the ability to knock on their door, which you don't, you know, to ask to come in and inspect. You have to, you have to plan your inspections ahead of time. So I, I, I think we're, we might be overcomplicating things to include the in-home sharing of space, my feeling. I don't, think, I don't think we need to burden our system with that level. Shalini and then Jennifer? Yeah, I would agree that, and especially given that our goals are to support families to have, you know, um, 
additional uh, rental revenue, small family homes, rentals, social justice, all of that taken. Like we want to make it easier for people to stay within families, to stay within Amherst. And one of the ways they do that is by renting out and so to make it as easy as possible. And it's not conflicting with our goals here of maintaining the property and quality because the people are living in it. So I think we don't, we need to leave it out. Yeah. Jennifer? Yeah, I agree. I mean, my experience for years living where I live is there is no issue, you know, with owner occupied. And really, even if it's an ADU and, and their students, if the owner's on the premise, it's just a whole different, it's fine. I mean. Thank you. Before I go to Chris, I do have one question that maybe Chris can answer, which is why I want to ask it before she, she, she talks, which is the Airbnbs, potentially many of them would fall into this category too. Is that correct? And should we try to treat Airbnbs that are renting serially to different people different than a person renting a room to the same person over the year? So, so add that question to Chris and Rob's responses. Uh, Chris. I'm not sure I fully understood the question, but I think that um, our zoning bylaw covers the issue of renting a room to someone for an extended period of time. And so, um, and that would be an owner occupied dwelling that where you would rent a room. So I was also thinking about my question while you were asking your question. So I'm not sure if I fully understood it, but um, what I wanted to say was I wanted to get some information about duration of rental and you were talking about this with regard to airbnbs so i remembered that there was some uh, condition and it was on one east pleasant street and the condition was that um, the tenants in that building could not have a guest for more than 14 consecutive days or more than 30 days per year so that's another way of looking at it you know number of consecutive days and then number of days throughout the year. So I just wanted to offer that information to you. And I'm sorry, I wasn't able to really answer your other question. That's fine. Thank you. Uh, Rob. Uh, I think I agree with everybody so far. Um, I think the letting of rooms in your home is, is a very different situation. I, I can't say that there aren't ever problems uh, in those situations. And, you know, I can say that we're available to respond and have helped in situations, uh, in those living situations. So, you know, people still can contact us uh, and, and get a building inspector or health inspector to help, um, probably more often in those situations, helping the owner of the property, um, with, with what they're dealing with. Um, but I don't, I was, I don't suggest that we need to permit or, uh, register those those properties and I would feel the same way about the Airbnb that's operating in that way short term that you know clearly has a, a short term time frame to uh, the stay. Thank you. Any other comments Shalini? Uh, I'm looking at our goals for this bylaw and I was just looking at the climate action goals and I wonder if they play out here in determining the type of license or exemption. I'm just throwing it out there that do we wanna give some sort of incentive and especially like if the license type is going to help later on with the inspections or you know like fee structures or things like that, would it make sense to create or have like a form which is kind of some sort of, uh, it's an energy efficient home. You know, if someone has invested in their rentals, then giving them some sort of um, break later on, like even if it's a thing in the form, so that later on then they are given some sort of exemption. Thank you, Shalini. I'll, I'll note it down for future conversation and for thoughts on things here, um, given our current conversation, it sounds like that might be an exemption to something else or a fee structure lowering versus a not having to get a permit given what I've heard the conversation heading towards here. So it's 610 right now. I think um, 
I, I'm happy to hear any last comments. I think we've gotten through what we wanted to, to get an idea of how to come back with a draft in two weeks. Um, I will tell you what my plan is. Um, my plan is to take some of the language we've had, take these notes. I took great notes, um, come up with a draft um, and I will present that draft in two weeks. I intend to speak to at least one CRC member myself before I present that draft. I've done that with the comprehensive housing policy before um, where I've made a draft and then sent it to one member for comment before I said, here, it's going to that. Um, that's not assigning to two people. That's my intention um, to do that. And we can talk later as to whether we send these sort of drafts to different people, depending on the different things. So it doesn't all fall on me. Um, it sounds like given what I saw today from Pam, that Pam might be interested in putting some of those sections together too. Um, but but that is my thought is, is at least for this one to, for me to start with it, or you know, if, if Pam wants to, to to take that, I don't know how good of notes she took. So, um, um, but but we'll assign each one to one person to bring it back with language, and then we'll truly discuss specific language and make comments on that at the next meeting. Um, I'll take. I, I figured I'd take this one this time just so we can see how it goes. Um, but thoughts on that before we move on to the rest of the agenda. Um, I'm going to go with Michelle first, and then I'll go Jennifer and Pam. I just want to say, Mandy, if I can be a resource at all, given I'm not a member and, and won't, you won't run into open meeting law issues with me, I don't, I don't think. Um, I would be happy to help you with that. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer and then Pam. Um, this isn't a direct response. It was just something I wanted to say before the end of the meeting. Can a committee um, have any, like, I guess following up on Michelle's question at the very beginning of what kind of our goal of what is some of the issues we're trying to address. Can a committee have something like a public forum where we might at some point to hear from residents what's going on and then also to share what we're do doing so they have input? Um, we could probably call that as a special meeting and then treat it like a public forum, yes, if we wanted to at a, a certain time. Um, I think if I haven't looked at the work plan too closely recently, but I think there's a couple of them sort of fed throughout when we have more language and have had more discussion. Um, we're hoping with the community click we use today and, and there will be eventually the small towns webpage to also that will do that as we get that going where community will be able to give offline, off meeting comments on stuff and the drafts will stay up on that website too um, as, as the UMass folks work together, the whole goal is to use a website similar to Engage Amherst to, to continue these conversations outside of meetings. So we can talk about when to put the forums or special meetings with forums throughout when the best time is, but yeah, we could do that. Yeah, I mean, I've actually had gotten emails from people saying, could we invite, you know, counselors to their neighborhoods? <laughs> so that's just to put that out there. Okay, Pam. I would love to support the idea of the public forum. I think that's excellent. And and again, it's sort of let's get people's thoughts more generally before we have these detailed discussions of, you know, is the comma correct? Because I think people really want to weigh in on the basic premise, the basic com, um, um, concept of it. So well, I love the idea and would support it. Um, and then I was actually had raised my hand to volunteer to do this text because I had already prepared it. Um, but if Mandy wants to do it, I'll, I'll be glad to help. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Pat. Yeah, just a quick comment on a public forum or public meeting. It needs to include students. Um, so there needs to be direct outreach to students who are renting prop uh, in town. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I will figure out and come up with some proposed dates for something like that. Um, involving students gets very difficult given the time of year right now for even if we were to try and do this in two to three weeks, UMass is gone. Um, even if we were to try and do it very quickly um, with the turnover and my understanding of when rentals, like leases end. So um, that might 
we'll have to talk because um, I'm not sure we could get something organized and publicity out in under two weeks and uh, given when UMass graduation is. Um, so we'd be looking at late August, early September potentially, which I know is three months into our schedule, but given how long some of these are, that's only about halfway through our process. Um, so plenty of time to still be modifying stuff and all. Um, and, and we won't have talked about a number of the things already anyway. So um, I'll talk with Pam Rooney next week as, as we agenda set to figure out um, some thoughts on that. But yes, student outreach on that and inclusion. OK. Um, so I want to thank um, Mahmoud for sitting through this. I hope, I know we haven't had a lot of attendees for this one. I hope the ones that were there were able to log on and, and participate on this. Um, I thought it was a very fruitful conversation and we're gonna, it's gonna be a long, a long chat that, that'll go back and forth. So thank you all for that. We're gonna move on on our agenda um, at this time to item 3C. Um, the planning board appointment recommendations, adoption of selection guidance, and preferred interview dates and times. So the selection guidance is in the packet. I know we talked about it last week or two weeks ago, I guess, at the last meeting. Um, when I went back and reviewed specifically the town council policy, it says we must adopt it by majority vote of the, of the committee. So that's why it's back on the agenda for the actual vote instead of just a consensus of here's what it is. So, so that should be in the packet. Um, and so I'm basically looking for a motion to adopt the so selection guidance planning board selection guidance as presented, unless someone has some modifications to it. Shalini. No modifications, but I need to leave because I have a district meeting starting soon. So okay. thank you. Bye everyone. Thank you, Shalini. Pam. I move that we adopt the selection criteria as, as prepared, revised April 15, 2022. Um, it's basically, what are we looking for for an effective body? It does not include actual um, uh, interview questions, but I think, you know, so we don't need to go into that. It's, it's basically, what do we look for in a healthy uh, and engaged body? So I would, I move we adopt it. Adopted as presented. I'll second that motion. Um, any conversation on that? Seeing none, um, I'm an I. Uh, Pat. Aye. Pam. Aye. Jennifer. Aye. Okay, that's unanimous with Shalini, one, one absent, which is Shalini. Um, preferred interview dates and times. So, in past recommendation cycles, um, the CRC has endeavored to do the interviews at on the day and at the time that the board that we're interviewing for meets, but off week from that board meeting, if that makes sense. So for planning board, that would be a Wednesday night that is not a planning board meeting. For ZBA, that would be a Thursday night that is not a ZBA meeting. Um, Thoughts on going that route or trying to do these interviews during a meeting of CRC for sometime between 4.30 and 6.30 on a Thursday. What is this committee's preference before I pull for open dates for people? I don't have a preference. Pat? Uh, I'd prefer, uh, if possible, uh, I would prefer it to be during the regular 4.30, 6.30 CRC meeting. Um, my schedule is very tight. Um, Pam, do you have a thought? Yes. <laughs> what is your thought? <laughs> <laughs> my thought is that um, I believe more planning board or potential planning board members, actually, we don't, actually, they don't already have this schedule because they may not be on the planning board. So um, it does. It would make sense to me to do it on an off week for the planning board. It would get whoever is applying used to that schedule. Um, um, Pat's idea of doing it during our period, um, maybe, we, maybe we have two options. One is during our 
particular meeting period and the other is on off Wednesday. So it sounds like there's some preference for one or the other. And so I'll pull all of the committee and all of the current applicants for interview dates and we'll find one that everyone can make. And that's, that's what we'll pick if there's no true strong preference consensus wide from the committee one way or the other. So that takes care of item 3C. Look for that poll in the next couple of weeks. Pam. I was going to say if we could if we could target uh, the week of the starting May 11th, we've got 11th, 12th would be really logical opportunities to do something. It's a couple of weeks out. Um, yeah, that's that's and, probably actually not targetable. Um, because if we go with the 11th, the statements of interest have to be posted on the 4th, no later than the 4th, which is less than a week away. Um, and so I have to get all of that to the candidates and they have to have time. Um, so I would actually be targeting probably the third or fourth week in May or fourth or fifth, whatever these are. Um, I need to let you know that I am very likely going to be out of town on the 25th or 26th. Okay. I may yeah. be able to participate on the 26th, but I'm really not sure. I, I will be targeting that week, the week after, um, and the week before probably um, is what I'll send through with dates. Because um, I'll, I'll look at all sorts of things, but but we'll see what I can get back. Um, I can put a preliminary, I, I, I'll, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> but those are probably the, the weeks I'm targeting. Um, moving on, um, I didn't say this at the beginning, obviously the ZBA appointment recommendation sufficiency of applicant pool, I did not pull from this agenda, um, but you noticed there is nothing in the packet related to this one. And I think Pam, who's sort of in charge of this, will agree that we still do not have enough of a pool and we still have enough time that we can continue urging people to apply without having to make a tough decision as to whether we need to move to interviews um, and statements of interest without a truly sufficient pool. Uh, Pam, would you agree with that? Totally. So I think our point on this one is keep urging people to consider ZBA. It's <laughs> <Fine. laughs> the real point. Um, so with that, there are no discussion items, general public comment. Um, we, everyone has left at this point, so we don't have anyone left for general public comment, um, but we did accept public comment during this meeting for the bulk of what we discussed. Pat. Yeah, this is separate and it's personal. Um, I had to leave the meeting briefly. Uh, I let Mandy Jo know that I, that was happening. Um, I have been in remission from Crohn's disease for several years and um, given medication that I'm currently on, um, I'm having symptoms again. So this will be true about every meeting I'm in um, because I can't trust my body right now. But I wanted you to know that I'm not just sliding out because it feels good to leave or something. So if we were boring you, no. <laughs> oh, well, no. a little. <laughs> Thank you for, for making that known and being so open about, about your health, Pat. Um, and, and obviously, whatever you need, we, we, we understand. Um, we're going to move on to minutes. Um, I'll make the motion to adopt the April 14th, 2022 meeting minutes as presented. Is there a second? Second. Okay. We're gonna give that to Jennifer. She was like a half a second ahead, I think. <laughs> um, and any comments on that? Seeing none, um, we'll start with Jennifer. Uh, aye. Pam. Aye. Uh, Pat. Aye. And Mandy is an aye, so those are adopted. Um, I'm going to say this again. I always feel bad because Rob's the one that cuts out so quickly, but I want to thank Rob and John and Chris um, for coming. I know these are um, conversations and all and, and you guys' input. Um, and I know Dave's been silent the whole time, but when he offers input, your, your input's invaluable to, to the work we're doing here. So we, we thank you for coming. Please pass that on to Rob. I One of these times or many of these times, hopefully I'll continue to remember to do that earlier before he leaves. <laughs> but I know you guys are extremely busy. So so we thank you. Your input today was, was very valuable. Um, I have no announcements. Um, 
the next agenda um, will be as every agenda will be the residential rental bylaw, whatever we can fit in that will obviously be on it. Um, we've had flood maps referred to us, so I that probably will not be next week. I have to be on, um, make myself a note. I have to get on um, noticing the public hearing for flood maps. Um, so I, we're going to figure out when that public hearing is. We'll schedule that in. We have until mid um, April, May, June, late June to to get that one done, sort of. But we probably don't want to wait that long. Um, um, but Pam, on that, you look like you're trying to say something about flood, flood maps. Yeah, um, I would say the sooner we can do that, the better. And the reason I'm, I'm just thinking that there are so many conversations about the different school sites, and I know that the flood, the flood maps and the adjustments of flood maps. I think, if I heard correctly, were the basis of the site conversation for Fort River. So it would be really important to know what's possible for there. Okay, so I'll see what I can do um, with that. Our next meeting is the 12th, but the first notice would have had to go in the paper today. So I will we'll probably aim for the 26th, which is about the first time I can get the notices published for. Um, so because, yeah, so we'll aim for May 26th and I'll get those notices out. If we end up with a... And, and know soon enough with a different meeting of CRC because of interviews, we might try to do two things at once on a different date, maybe if, if we can figure out that time quick enough. Um, appointment process will always be on the agenda. And then I'm not sure if the Historical Commission is going to be finished with their work or not and ready for us to review the preservation bylaw. But if they are, that would go on next meeting. If not, it would go on the meeting after. So that's pretty much what we're doing flood maps, residential bylaw, and historic preservation, the preservation bylaw for the next month or so, that month, month and a half, that's what we'll be dealing with and, and appointments. So it's gonna be the agenda most of the time. Any other comments, Pam? Question, um, preservation bylaw, do you have any idea of what the topic of conversation is? Um, I will send out um, some information I got from Chris. She said that they pretty much, the conversation at their last meeting was very informative, um, and, but they didn't reach any type of consensus. And I think they might even have a subcommittee talking about trying to reach consensus to then bring back to the historical commission. Um, so I, I think my gist from her email was that they're struggling with the information about um, the open meeting law and only one person, but also managing amounts of work for them. Um, and then there was also some, there, there were some other recommendations from the planning board that I know they talked about um, regarding 75 years that all sort of, uh, basically our conversation that they, <laughs> they repeated, right? 75 years versus 50, how does that affect how many buildings and all of that? And they just weren't in one meeting able to get to a, a, a decision. Um, and so we'll keep monitoring that to see when it comes up. Any other questions, comments, or items not anticipated? Seeing none, thank you all for your time. I'm adjourning the meeting at 6.29 p.m. Have a nice evening. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.